Good morning, everyone. And really thank you, thankful for the invitation. It is a real pleasure to be here. I have been involved with the maritime field for the past 15 years, and it was only recently that I started collaborating on women's issues. When I was hired at the World Maritime University in Sweden, I was the second female associate professor employee in an institution run by men. I'm also the first Venezuelan and South American there. Without a doubt, Sweden is a very liberal country. However, the university is not a Swedish institution. The university was created by the International Maritime Organization, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations. YMU is a postgraduate maritime university with the aim to further enhance the objectives and goals of IMO through education, research, and capacity building to ensure safe, secure, and efficient shipping. I wanted to quickly share a few pictures of our new building, which was just inaugurated last month. It is a charming old building with a very modern new wing, which was designed by architect Kim Hudson, who is the son of John Hudson, who designed the famous Opera House building in Sydney, Australia. But we are going to take a look at what goes on inside these contemporary walls. Gender balance, as we all know, is one of the main factors that promote diversity within institutions. What are the policies of the organization regarding the hiring of female personnel? In order to find out, I need to have a look at the UN. It all started in 1970 with resolution 2715, which called for gender balance in staffing equal opportunities. Three years later, in 1978, resolution 33 slash 143 establishes a 25% quota at the secretariat with other organizations to establish such quotas. 20 years ago, Two interest events happened. In 1995, the, the Four World Conference on Women, also known as the Beijing Conference on Women, they talk about gender mainstreaming as a major global strategy. Later on that year, in 1995, in its resolution 50 164, the General Assembly called for 50 50 representation in managerial and decision making positions by 2000 at all levels in the Secretariat and throughout the United Nations. In 2000, the UN adopted the famous Millennium Development Goal, stressing the need to promote gender equality and empower women. Five years later, in 2005, Resolution 59-164, the Assembly regretted that the goal of achieving overall gender equality at the professional level and above by 2000 had not yet been achieved. Where are we today, 2015? The Secretary General has been redoubling his efforts. However, these goals, these goals have not been achieved. There is not harmonization in the way that is reflected throughout the United Nations, and sometimes there has been regression. Are there smart thinking at the United Nations, IMO, and YMU? Let's look at what is going on at my place of work. A few methodological considerations before, we look in, before looking at the findings. Question. Considering the fact that my type of question is a how question, how the situation of female employees has changed over time at YMU. The case study methodology seemed to be the most relevant. Context. I also kept in mind that I was trying to gain a deeper understanding of why of an ongoing process in a situation over which I, as a researcher, had no control. 
What I mean by that is that we, are, we were not in a lab working with controlled variables. Type. With regard to the type of case study, I was interested in looking at the same data in order to find similitude, difference, compare, and over a period of time of four years from 2010 to 2014. Now let's look at the numbers. As we can see in this slide, during the first 23 years of the university, there were no female professors at all. But that reality began to change in 2010, 40 years after the first initiative at the UN regarding gender mainstreaming and equal opportunity. The 27-year male-dominated academic scene began to change in 2010. In that period, most of the old faculty was in the process of retiring. Therefore, a total of 11 faculty positions became available. Now let's look at the hiring process. 2010, first female academic staff hire, assistant professor. 2011, second female academic staff hire, assistant professor. 2012, third female academic staff hire, assistant professor. 2013, the first hire assistant professor left YMU. The second one was promoted to associate professor, and a female research associate was promoted to lecturer. There were no changes in 2014. 2015, the female lecturer was promoted to associate uh, uh, assistant professor. As of today, there is one associate professor and two assistant professors who are female workers, making a total of three. The rest of the position in total were filled by men. So let's look at what that number three represents in context. Out of a total of 21 employees, there are 80 male professors and three female professors. In terms of percentage, we are looking at female 14% and male 86%. However, I cannot deny that from 1997 to the present year, an enormous effort was made by IMO and our donors to increase the enrollment of women in our master's program. And currently, the number of enrolled enroll women approximately represent 33% of the annual intake. These efforts, however, were limited to a student's intake and did not focus on bringing gender balance to our faculty. So while thinking about the achievement of the female faculty team during these years, I try to think about areas where there have been a significant impact. And I guess I could, I could talk a bit about my own experience in Malmo. Shortly after joining the university, I was asked by the president to organize a women's conference at YMU. The project was a challenge. As you can imagine, the conference was not a priority for many, and as a matter of fact, there was a fear that even would become a repetition of a previous women's conference. There was lack of funding, and some people even argue that we should not interfere with the efforts of IMO's Technical Cooperation Division. For me, personally, the conference project meant a lot of cashing up, because I had no previous experience with women, women issues. So I started gathering information about women's rights, and then I came across a book by Didi Myers called Why Women Should Rule the World. What a name. And while reading that book, several phrases started to pop up, such as a study shows that women are paid less than men for doing the same job, Women are given fewer resources to achieve the same results. Women are denied promotions. Women are blocked from uh, the informal networks that uh, gives opportunity. The more I read the book, the more I started to question the conditions under which I had been hired. 
I was happy to, to be one of the first female faculties of the university, the first one from a Latin American country, and about being a role model for other women in the sector. But as the reality of my contract began to sink in, I realized that was I, learning, uh, was I earning less than my colleagues for doing the same job? Had I been given less resources, less office space, and smaller grants than men with similar experience? Of course, in an environment where some members of the faculty had started retiring and new colleagues were, colleagues were coming on board, this information was not difficult to find. Very soon, I came to the conclusion that, in fact, the management has gotten a pretty good deal by hiring me. I was hired at the lowest faculty category when, in fact, I clearly met the requirement for a higher one. In addition, I was even older than most of the new faculty, so how could I have end up being at the lowest level? So while working on preparing the women's conference, I got a deeper and first-hand understanding of what it means to be a woman working in an organization run by men. Since the idea of a women's conference had not won the heart of many at the university, I thought that we needed to make something different and big. So I gathered a highly diverse team, and we ended up with a group formed by colleagues from different countries such as Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Sweden, the UK, and uh, the US, and Venezuela. There were two males and six females. We had a holistic approach and caught the attention of several actors uh, of the maritime sector, among them the UN, IAMO, the maritime administrations, the port sector, and very importantly, the academic sector. This conference needed to be not only about women, but it needed to compete against previous academic conferences had held at YMU in terms of academic level. We issue a call for papers, establish a truly international scientific committee aiming for the creation of a book. The result was beyond everyone's expectation. The conference was one of the most successful events ever held at the university. We received an incredible number of abstracts and paper. We even had to organize poster presentations in order to accommodate those speakers that didn't make it to the final program. Many events took place regarding the advancement of women at YMU after the conference. We established the YMU Women's Association that encompasses our alumni around the world so that YMU female students now have a network of alumni and also female role models. We edited the first female-only faculty book, which had been promoted worldwide by the International Maritime Organization. And we are still collaborating with IAMO regarding several projects related to the advancement of women seafarers in several countries. So far, so good. So women indeed are able to make a difference in any organization, or is the difference only limited to gender issues? So what about other areas? I started to do some smart thinking on my own, of my own to see if by looking at things differently, I could gain a deeper understanding of the situation. First, I wanted to measure the performance of the female faculty on its daily job and compare that to our male colleagues. I tried to calculate an average of the teaching hours of all categories of professors to see if there were any difference between female and male professors. The result did not show any significant differences. One possible explanation for this is the fact that professors could be less active in teaching hours, perhaps to, due to the fact that they are often engaged in other projects, such as research projects, and carry the burden of being program directors. I also look at the publishing data, and the results were consistent with those obtained from analyzing teaching hours. 
So after looking at this data, I was able to conclude that the female faculty did as well as the male faculty in publishing and hours of teaching. Then my smart thinking approach led me to look at the decision-making bodies within YMU, where in principle all faculty should be able to join to see how gender balanced they are. There are six committees, and this is how they have functioned. And this is how they have functioned during the past four years. The three main strategic areas of the institution, management, curriculum, and assessment, information, communication, and technology steering, are all exclusively composed of males. The PhD and research committee had 11% female participation for the first time in 2013, right before disappearing. The executive professional development committee, uh, committee started out in a more promising way towards gender balance. However, the trend has reversed and is now showing an 80 to 20 ratio in 2015. The Quality Assurance Committee showed a, ba show a balance composition of 50 percent only during 2012. The other three years, it shows a 66 male versus 33 percent female composition. This is the only committee where a steady female presence was identif identified. Now let's look at the management level positions that were opened during 2010 to 2014. During this period, five management positions have become vacant, such as PP Academic, Register, Assistant Register, Head of Maritime Education and Training Specialization, Head of Maritime Law and Policy Specialization. Only one out of the five were filled by a woman, the Register. In this period, three new positions have been created. VIP International, Head of Marine Environmental and Ocean Management Specialization, and Director of Ex Executive Professional Development Courses. All new positions have been filled by males. Therefore, until June 2015, not only the most important strategic committees at YMU were led by males, but also the most prominent management positions, president, vice president, <coughs> vice president academic, vice president international, and associate dean. However, something totally unexpected happened at our university, which I think will become a game changer for, the, for YMU. I am a Secretary General, Mr. Koji Sekumisu, announced the appointment of Dr. Cleopatra Dumbia Henry. She will be the first female in the role, as well as the first president from a developing country. She will, start, she will start in July, and it will be inter very interesting to carry out follow-up analysis in the next few years to find out if and how this could have an impact on the trends we have identified so far. But before, before we speculate about potential changes that a new female president could bring to YMU, I would like to for us to look at what the smart thinking means and how we can apply to our case study. As Dr. Markman says in his book called Smart Thinking, smart has nothing to do with intelligence or IQ. If he focuses on the content of what we all know and how we all apply it in such a way that it enables us to find solutions to our problems using all the things we already know. So I think it's time to summarize our findings. It has been shown by a number of scientific studies that diversities contribute to a better performance in organization. 
Therefore, if we apply smart thinking to our case study, by balancing the participation and of male and female faculty within the bodies of the organization, in this case, the strategic committees, we may be able to perform better in several fields at the university. Our case has also shown us that the 50-50 gender staffing balance promoted by the United Nations had never been reached, especially in a, small, in a smaller organization such as YMU. Gender staffing balance initiative alone do not guarantee the contribution of diversity in any organization. Perhaps this initiative should be combined with other measures such as the full involvement of women in decision-making bodies and positions within the organization in order to reap the benefits and achieve the full potential of diversity. Now, I would like to present you my conclusions to the case. From 2010 to 2014, women were higher but they started lower on the ladder. IAMO has developed strategies to increase the number of female students at YMU, but has not been able to do the same with the faculty. So far, the 14% female faculty have brought about important advancement regarding the empowerment of women in the maritime and poor sectors. The absence of female faculty in decision-making bodies and positions such as, I, I believe, the university is not utilizing its faculty to its full potential. I believe the university will start a new era with the appointment of our new faculty, of your new female president. It will be an opportunity to apply smart thinking to the organization and see how it develops. Therefore, I would like to end my presentation by saying that now, the case study on the impact of female recruits on the World Maritime University really begins. I thank you all for your attention.